So, um, you know, this is a first for us. We're uh, trying to uh, do a little bit of an open conversation, you know, at the end of the uh, the Sundar's presentation, as with a lot of these uh, future spaces, uh, it said uh, conversations, uh, there's like a lot of unanswered questions. And there's a lot of things I think we want to talk about. Um, Sundar and I have had some really exciting conversations about the future of museums, about technology and such. And we just want to kind of create a forum for, for you all to sort of join in on that conversation, but also very importantly, to be able to ask your your, your questions. Um, so if you have questions, throw them in the chat window. Also just like, introduce yourself in the chat. Sundar, will both, both of us will be looking at it. Uh, we will be tailoring our responses uh, and conversation based on that. So um, let's, uh, let's kick it off from there. So Sundar, welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, excited to uh, apologize more about some other stuff that we didn't get to last time. But uh, also, I didn't get a chance to really see what kind of questions people brought up. So, uh, you know, as, as we were chatting a little bit, it uh, really was uh, like I was intrigued the directions that people would go in. So let's see where this goes. OK, great, great. So is there anybody who wants to uh, ask the first question or should I queue it up? All right. Let's see. OK, well, let me let me uh, let me start off sooner. So, yeah. you know, one of the things that I, I think um, is kind of interesting about the Museum of the Future is that, you know, obviously um, it's it's done and now <laughs> and it, and it forecasts, you know, well into the future. But but, you know, it's such a dynamic time and there's so much new technology coming out. You know, how is the Museum of the Future thinking about that? How are they thinking about you know, investing back into the experience to make sure that it consistently feels contemporary? Um, that's a good question. And we get asked this relatively regularly. Now, uh, one of the slightly complicated situations with where we are is that Dubai is a very non-stagnant city. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, anything that's been around for more than maybe four days, people are like, well, when is it going to change? Um, it, actually, even within the first, I, I remember within the first week of us being open, one of the most common questions I was asked is, when will this change? And I was like, can we just give it a little bit of time so people can like experience it a little bit? Um, I think this is something that a lot of people, a lot of uh, institutions grapple with actually. Uh, we have to grapple with it from a couple of perspectives. One is like we sort of set ourselves up potentially for a little bit of negative feedback or criticism because we're calling ourselves the museum of the future. And everyone's like, well, the future is gonna keep moving. So how are you going to accommodate for that? And so uh, I would say the thing that we always had in mind was that you need to have a really strong foundation that you can make changes on top of. So, and this is this is something that's not new to the museum world. Like you can go, tr you can attempt to put a forklift upgrade in place every I don't know three years or every two years or whatever. But there's a there's a very significant emotional cost to it. Um, just because you change something doesn't mean that the experience will hold together, you know, narratively the same way. Also, what people were super excited about that first time may not, you know, come back. So there's always that, you know, uh, second guessing yourself about, oh, we shouldn't have made certain changes. And then finally, uh, it's just trying to make sure that people are actually taking enough time to breathe the experience that you have created. And then the next round of it, is an evolution of where you are or like, you know, a, a radical enough departure that they are still thinking about the narrative in a, in a kind of coherent way, you know? And by that, I mean, you know, you could go, yeah, the museum of the future, I mean, as, as much of that as just an idea should now focus on something that is one aspect of the different topics that we've talked about, you know, let's say everything has to like tie back significantly closer or it has to be significantly more about new interactive technologies, which, Fortunately for us, nothing new has shown up in the last three years. Like yeah. in, in terms of like, you know, all we've seen is more screens. You know, it's not like, oh, there's this amazing new haptic technology that we have to integrate. And Apple Glass is already ready. And, you know, we should like put that up everywhere, even though everyone's talking about it. Um, but to go back to the to the original point of like, you know, these changes that need to happen in, in environments like Dubai, there's an expectation that it changes because it's kind of necessary for everything here that, that we're, we're in a very, very dynamic neighborhood. And so it doesn't matter whether we want it to change or whether we think it's good enough to stick around for a while. The change needs to happen for the sake of change. Sometimes, you know, like 
growth has to happen, death has to happen, you know, these kind of they, these kind of things, these cycles have to keep going. And in a way, that's kind of th those are the different um, sort of uh, provocations, I guess, that we are dealing with. You know, these are the, these are the parameters within which we're operating. Um, to specifically answer the question of when this change will happen, we have internally had these conversations, but I, I can't give you an exact timeline. But as with any institution, we are constantly thinking about, okay, how do we uh, refresh certain things or how do we learn from all the stuff that we've put in place so far? That's super interesting. Yeah, there are a couple of threads there that I think I'd love to sort of pick, pick apart. Um, I love the I love when you were saying that there's this like, expectation of change, which comes from the city of Dubai. Um, you know, it's been very interesting for me. Um, you know, I I started I, I I started you know Blue Cadet, and I you know I I'm like a Philadelphian, um, and Philadelphia is a city that's very very much rooted in the past. I mean, like it's like kind of like locked into that 1776 uh, era. Um, and like, there's a, there's an expectation of, in some ways, of like of not change, um, or like resistance to change in some ways. Um, and then I, I love Philadelphia also go visit Philadelphia. Philadelphia is wonderful. Um, but then, you know, I've been living in Los Angeles, you know, for the last, you know, a uh, couple of years. And that's a, you know, I think sort of like similar to Dubai, it's a frontier town. It's like, very, very much about like refresh and redo and what's new and next. And, you know, I just think it's one of the things that we had talked about before is like um, how much, you know, the culture of a museum or the function of a museum is so related to the, to the place uh, that that museum is in, you know, and like how, like, and I, and I just would kind of, I'd be curious that, you know, if, if you wanted to talk about that a little bit, because, you know, you've worked on a lot of different museums and it's like, you know, I don't know if the museum of the future would work in Philadelphia. I think it'd probably work in LA. I mean, and it certainly works in Dubai. So I'd love you. I'd love for you to sort of like tease out that a little bit. I think that it's an interesting idea of where some of these ideas work. Um, I mean, before coming here, like one of my favorite museums that I worked on at, in my previous gig was uh, the Museum of the City of New York. Oh it's, yeah. You know, people don't. It's it's a kind of non-visitation destination just because people just don't think about it so much except every student in New York who has to go there because their class took them there right mm -hmm. but it's it's fabulous it tells a story of a city that has transformed so much and Philadelphia although it is steeped in its history it's also a city that has undergone so many changes absolutely and it's also a very vibrant city in many many ways just because of the kind of cultural diversity that exists there, which I didn't realize until I started like delving into it significantly more. Uh, the kind of the food scene and all the different neighborhoods that are propping up. And, you know, like th there's a there's a kind of, uh, I guess there's a manifestation of the future in the reality of how the city operates. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in this contrast of Philadelphia versus, the, uh, versus LA is also this interesting thing of like, my favorite museum in LA is maybe the most futuristic museum of in in the world, and I don't know. Like, can you guess which one it is? The most futuristic museum of the world in, the world, in LA. In the world by far. Are you going to talk about the Museum of Jurassic Technology? Of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is by far yeah. because it's like it's and the reason I say that is because it is the museum of the hyper local. Yeah, and it's so crazy hyper local that it is your idea of something that you would have made in your bedroom as a child make, make being made into an exhibit of like this oh I'm gonna put a lens on something with a little thing on the inside and you're like what is this and you go well there's a story and an interesting aspect of what the Museum of Jurassic Technology does is that they go this can be a museum and I think I mentioned this last time a little bit, but one of the things that I always grappled with was people coming and going, okay, how can you have a museum of the future? And uh, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but the, you know, you don't go to like the VNA or the Met to go look at a rock. They don't say, here's a rock, you know, or to the Philadelphia Fine Arts Museum or wherever, you know, like um, they say, here's a piece of granite that is a temple carving showing Shiva in this particular thing and its era, whatever, the circa, yeah, I mean, then it's the story that you're really coming for. Right. And things like the Museum of the Future are about the story. Like we're, we've got an artifact, which is a set of nar narratives that we have, we have said, this is where we are seeing a trajectory towards. And 
the the story around it is the only compelling reason for people to come through. The Museum of Jurassic Technology takes those little things, the, the stories of us, and puts them together into boxes and goes, this vitrine is the story of you. And it's so amazing to me that that, I mean, that, 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 that place kind of transformed the way I thought about stuff well before I ever got into the museum world at all. When I went there, I was like, this is the most amazing place I have ever been to. You know? Yeah. And if people have not been there, I recommend it very, very highly because it just gives you a sense of how storytelling can be done in a very compelling way with almost no budget at all whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're like, wow, this, oh, this is a well, shoestring. <laughs> No, it's a, you know, I, I mean, it's an amazing, it's an amazing museum. And yeah, absolutely. Highly, highly recommend it. Um, and, and you know, I would it's, add it, one more thing, which is like the point it. about how sustainability and stuff like that work and, and your previous point, and sorry, not to interrupt, but the, there was the, this point that you had brought up about the, the connecting to local environments. So one of the big questions that we always have to grapple with in culture institutions, event destinations, anything really like businesses is how do you make yourself compelling enough that somebody is going to take out their cash and give it to you? You know, yeah. like why, why should, why do I get the right to take your money? And sustainability at its core is kind of around that equation. You know, like I have given you something compelling that you feel is appropriate for you to give me whatever amount of transactional value we have put on it. And then when you leave, you go, yeah, that was worth it, you know, and in, yeah. in the context of whether, wherever that environment is. So how do you transfer that equation into different kinds of locales? So if it's a super local environment, is it about telling the story of the people in that place? And therefore, they feel like I'm coming to a place where you're telling my story. Or is it, is it a place like Dubai, which is so transient that you're coming to some, some place that has to blow your mind? And you're like, oh, OK, like, I get it. This, you've, you've made me satisfied for my expectation. Or, you know, like, the, I think the, those are the kind of questions that we always have to ask ourselves when we're when we're making this stuff. And I don't think there's an easy answer, but, you know, it, it's it's something that we don't talk about enough, maybe. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, no, absolutely. And that's, I mean, honestly, it's the, the whole point of why I'm doing these series is like, I feel like the, um, you know, this idea of museum making and place making, it's like, it's a little bit of a weird kind of siloed folk art. And I think in some ways that, that we call all these different types of institutions, museums can be very misleading. Um, because like sometimes what's happening in like themed entertainment is actually much closer to certain museums. And like some museums are like literally just, you know, they're, they're much closer to like wealthy people's private collections, um, that are made public, you know, and like, you know, and, and I, I, I would love to see, I'd love to see that mapped out in some way. Cause I, I feel like there is, there's a difference between like placemaking and museum making, um, you know, and really, okay. Yeah, I do. I do. You know, it's, I, I mean, let's, well, let's talk about that a little bit. Cause I, I think it's really, it's also interesting to think about who the audience is. Like, is the audience, the, the, the people that live in that place. And is it about sort of an, an amenity for the city and for the people who live there? Is it something to create identity, um, for that city? Um, and to say like, oh yeah, yeah, we, you know, like, you know, we are a, uh, you know, the Louvre, signals to the world that Paris is a legit cultural, you know, locale or the Met, um, you know, or is this something for, you know, that signals really to tourists, you know, and says like, okay, this is why you should visit us and take, take and transact with us because we, because we have this thing, or you should visit here. Like, I, I feel like there's like all these different functions of museums that we don't always parse out. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There's, um, <clears throat> So the, the, the museum of the future is not located like away from places, right? Like, so it is in one of the more residential kind of neighborhoods. I mean, it's convenient actually. It, yeah. it wasn't yeah. like purposefully in a residential neighborhood, but where it is located is within walking distance of a significant, uh, you know, residential population uh, of all kinds of backgrounds within a, 25 minute walk, maybe a 30 minute walk is basically the spread of every economic strata of Dubai, like, literally, which is crazy. Like it, there are very few places in Dubai that are like that, that, that provide that level of access to such a wide group of people. And similarly, I would say in New York, like in Manhattan, museums in Manhattan are very much like you know, they're accessible by everyone just because by virtue of the fact that Manhattan is an island. But let's say you go to the Getty in LA, you know, yeah. or LACMA 
for you know places like okay the, the museum of jurassic technology is a little bit different because it's very close to a residential neighborhood but mm -hmm. as soon as you go upscale a little bit because of this the requirements of a campus you know of a much larger space the the they're kind of institutional separations that come in you know so then you go okay like how, who are you really making this for so there's an interesting uh, project that, or directive that happened in the city of Medellin in Colombia, um, mm, yeah. where a number of libraries were actually set up in the barrios in, in like the favela areas that had been very much the, the kind of ground zero of drug violence and gang violence and things like that. Uh, with, and this was part of the, you know, Bloomberg's mayor's make the world kind of i forget the name of the project but yeah, yeah. uh the, the, that directive like, apparently started having some pretty significant like change to how people perceived cities operating for them because generally that library would have been put into a wealthy neighborhood but to move something like that a, a, an architect designed sort of a flagship uh institution into a neighborhood that normally wouldn't get that kind of thing changes how people really perceive themselves, you know? And I totally. think access is a super important part of this because these narratives, even though they're about everyone, oftentimes people feel like, oh no, this is not for me. This is for the wealthy people. Or this is for whoever. It's, it's a hard one to solve for, I think, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe it's, it's hard just because we're, we're so used to working a certain way, but maybe yeah. maybe that's part of a, a conversation of how to make experiences that that transcend those kind of boundaries. You know? Well, you know, it's really interesting too. you know, one of the things that you talked about was like proximity um, and proximity is not always accessibility. So like I, I remember. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, we do need. More. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. We're in the chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just thinking you know, I, I think... community is just like great. I had not heard that term. But marbleized communities, uh, I, 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 oh, I, think, I think they spell marginalized, but I like, I like the spell check. <laughs> like, yeah, like, I like the, I like the, uh, the spell, the, uh, the other spelling in some ways, but you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, in going back to Philadelphia, um, you know, the Philadelphia Museum of Art is like on the Schuylkill River, you know, and on the other side of the Schuylkill River, which is like very, very close walking distance is Mantua. And Mantua is like one of those, um, you know, it's one of those like opportunity zones. It's a, it's a very poor neighborhood. Um, and it's also like adjacent to Penn and Drexel and all that. But, you know, the PMA has always really struggled to say like, okay, how do we get people from Mantua to like walk across the bridge and come in here? And they'll be like, oh, well, you know, we'll do, uh, we'll, we'll make it free. We'll set up at these hours. We, you know, we'll change the labels on the, on the artworks. And it's like, they don't, they can't, they, they have a really hard time doing that because like they're literally asking people to enter into these like giant door columned, you know, like something that's like is, is a testament to the empire, you know, is like we're, we're oh like, God, yes. you know, we're just like, honestly, like, I don't even feel that welcome, you know, and it's like, and, you know, the mural arts program, which if people don't know, they should definitely look up um, muralarts.org, you know, they've done a lot of work in that in that neighborhood like actually creating tons and tons of public art and murals and also um reinvigorating the library and it's like that like and like it's like they're bringing art into that neighborhood you know and like because like even even like a five minute walk into an imperial building is just not going to do it yeah agreed and uh, but the irony is that they go oh they can just walk across the bridge <laughs> exactly so we, we left the door open we're not going to charge them like I know, but you have a moat, you know, exactly. <laughs> you know, we've, we've all seen the movies, what happens when you cross that bridge, you know, but uh, Pittsburgh deals with a very similar problem, you know, like amazing children's museum, there's an amazing mm -hmm. museums across the water from a lot of these communities. And but it is that, you know, there's a castle surrounded by a moat that you, people have to get to. So uh, there's an interesting thing that happened in the Museum of the Future. So uh, we have a space that is around the building and the building is in, near the financial district across this end of the subway station within, I would say 150 meters. There's an entire row of like, you know, building like residential buildings on the other side. So within, I was, as I said, within 30 minutes, there's a lot of different stuff going on. Okay. Now the day the museum opened, I, we went up before like 
the, the day we finished the museum, I should say, on February 21st, 2022, I walk out at like 12 midnight or 1 a.m. or something. And there are all these kids around and like all these people at, at night taking selfies and doing stuff. And this is before, like there's been like any serious commotion about the museum being open. I talked to one of the security guards and I was like, what's going on? He's like, yes, sir. As soon as the thing was done, like people started showing up. And I was like, what yeah. are they showing up for? He's like, well, there's a space to hang out. And yeah. you go, wow, this is interesting. And this is to this point of a community gathering space so actually, maybe I'll step back even further than this. One of the cool things about the museum, which I mentioned, is about the land is the landscape. Okay, the landscape wasn't an afterthought. The the footing of the building is landscaped, and it's landscaped with a diversity of things, lots of which is edible, which is kind of very cool. And uh, when they started landscaping, when I was on at the site office, there was one fine day when there was like swaths of the landscape that was completed, and the next morning, there are bees and butterflies on these plants. Okay? I love the story that anyone who knows me has heard probably a hundred times because it, it just it blows my mind that this happened. So I called up the landscaping company and I was like, "Did you guys bring the insects with you?" And this lady is like, "What are you crazy? Like what? <laughs> she's yeah. like, what are you talking about?" And she thought I was like blaming her, and she's like, "No, no, no, I didn't bring any insects." And like, I'm I'm trying to. It was a very funny conversation in retrospect because I'm trying to congratulate her and she's like being defensive. So this happened because nature was provided. And then like within a couple of days, there are pigeons and doves and all kinds of wildlife. And we have so much wildlife around the building now. It's kind of wild. I yeah. had not seen this before. The same thing happens with human beings. You provide a space that feels inviting, a space that feels like it's, it's going to feel safe. So we happen to accidentally have created this very safe space between buildings with the sense of water, people can sit around, they can do stuff, they're there to take pictures. It's like, it, it's very, very inviting. It feels like there's this giant egg, which is the, the museum, and like there's all this like space around it and it feels like a nest, you know? And I think when that happens, people will come and they will like be there. The, the yeah. tricky part for us is when those people show up, how do we collect their stories? Because that's the interesting part, mm -hmm. you know? Like, so, each generation wants to hear the stories of the next. So these people are going to leave a remnant and go, you know, that's the place I made out the first time in front of the museum. And nobody like, you know, saw, saw this, you know, or, yeah, like, yeah. I remember going there and smoking or whatever, you know, like the, the kind of like memories that you, you manufacture, but that's the most important part. That's the imprint that we have to somehow go, okay, I got to capture that, you know? So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, that's actually so funny that I, you know, I, I hadn't even thought about that, but I'm realizing like, how many times I, I I used to get high at the PMA in high school? Um, it's just like, <laughs> there you go. It's just like, I was like, oh, that was exactly. a nice day. So I, that that that's was why my, you like the place. That's how I transacted with it. In the, yeah, I'm walking around their little outdoor sculpture. That's how I transacted with it in, in my teenage years. And that's I, I, uh, I that's that probably has something to do with my affinity for. It. <laughs> but, you know, it's. But what's so interesting is like, you know, when we're talking about this and I, and I, and now for some reason, I've got the Philadelphia Museum of Art in my mind and not to knock them because I, again, world-class museum, world-class, you know, um, collection, um, incredible staff, well-intentioned people. But like, if the wealthy people were on the other side of that river, you know, and, the, and it was actually nestled in a poor neighborhood, I think the wealthy people would walk over because it's a psychological mode. It's not a physical mode, you know? And it's like, you know, and it's like, what are the things that you can do to sort of like, like to, to address that psychological mode, this idea that like, you know, like, okay, this is a place that you actually belong, you know, or like, this yeah. is like, or like, they, like there are stories here that are relevant to you in some way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think making it a place to hang out, I think this is the biggest thing, right? Like we, at least in the US, in a lot of places that I have seen, it, it feels like you cannot hang out in a place if you're not yeah. the right type of person. Mm -hmm. I remember like one of my favorite places in the city used to be uh, Christopher Street Park because all the trans kids used to come out and hang out there at night. You know, like this, this was their safe yeah. spot. And there were like these things that, and it was, it was so weird. I was like, why this park of all of the parks in the city? And it's basically, they could go down Christopher Street. They had this like, they had a support system that was set up for them from so many different layers. 
And it's such a, it's such a unique story because you would see these kids show up around 9 p.m. So I used to live in kind of in the neighborhood uh, the first couple of years that I moved to New York. And we just hang out there. And these kids would be there like from Thursday night until basically Saturday night. They would just, you know, hang out in that neighborhood and they just hang out. And yes. the cops didn't tell them to go away in that particular area. Anywhere else, the cops would. And everyone else from an affluent neighborhood knows that they cannot stay overnight somewhere because they can go home, you know? But we don't make places for people to hang out and feel safe at night. And that's what they need. When else are they going to do it? They're, they're working all day. So mm -hmm. in a way, like it's the moat is not about them not being able to cross over. They're happy to cross over. We don't give them a reason to be able to cross over and stay. They're going to cross over for 30 minutes and then the cops show up and go, hey, actually, you got to leave because it's 10 p.m. Yeah. And I've been in that situation where I like, you know, when I was in, in, in uh, college, would go to the park at night and every public park closes at 11 p.m. in Iowa, you know, and you go, this is insane. Why is the park closed at 11 p.m.? Is there something happening here that, you know, we shouldn't be here for? And you go, oh, well, you know, all of the bad stuff happens at night. And there's a, a super fun thing that just started happening in Dubai, which is, and I just heard, uh, heard about it two days ago, which is that they have started night beaches. Oh, I love Amazing it. That's, a, that's awesome. Amazing concept, right? So in LA, can you go to the beach at night? No, you can't because the cops will be like, no, what are you doing here? At night? You know, unless you sneak past them, they'll be like, there's no lifeguard. There's no blah, 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 blah. So what did Dubai do? They set up lifeguards and lighting and fun and all of the stuff. And yeah. all night, all night, you can be at the beach because it's hot in the daytime. And you go like, the, these are the kind of mechanisms that allow people to come and be there and, and do whatever. You know, like as long as you provide a mechanism for people to feel invited, they can come there and like, I mean, they have to be able to create their stories. And as soon as they can create their stories, they will come. You know, yeah. the reason that we go to these places is because we can create our stories because we can tell somebody, hey, I went to this place. Whether we like art or not is irrelevant. And most of us, I think, you know, I, I do this all the time. I hate going to art museums, but I say I went to an art, art museum. I'm kidding, of course. But, you know, <laughs> but I went to the Whitney because it makes me look like a better human being. You know? Oh, that's so funny. Oh, I, I mean, one, one I could totally talk about. I could talk about that forever. But, you know, it's let's not because I, I, I don't think. <laughs> but, you know, I, I you think um, yourself, man. <laughs> You, no, you, no, no, no. I actually, no, I love, well, the thing is, as like, a business I mean, owner I, in this field, you cannot disparage the museum world. No, you know, but the thing is, like, oh, I like, the thing is, like, I love and hate the museum world. Um, you know, like, I, I like, and actually, I personally, like, love the Whitney and, like, I love contemporary art, but it's, but it's like, it's because, like, I was an art history major and also, like, I, I, I know the rules. You know, I, like, I know who the players are. It's like, you know, and like, it's, it's funny because like, in some ways, I, I, I grew, I somehow learned the rules of that space, you know, so like, I go there and I feel, I feel like, okay, I understand this, I get this, and I like this, you know, and like, whereas like, I actually, even growing up in Philadelphia, like, no one ever really taught me about football, um, you know, like, like, I'm sorry, dad, you just didn't, he didn't do, like, and maybe I didn't show like a lot of interest in that, but like, I don't really know the, I know the rules, but like, I don't, but I don't feel conversant in it. So like, if I show up at a sporting event, I kind of feel weird, you know, and I feel like awkward, you know, and it's just like, oh, this is a place where I just don't, I just like, I just don't feel like I, I know the rules. And like, and a lot of times when I'm working, when we're working with art museums, particularly, I'm like, look, you know, it's really incumbent on you guys to like, tell people, like, don't just be like, this is important, but like, tell them why it's important and like, why it's interesting, like why it's cool. Like, cause like, if you, if you are showing someone a Jackson Pollock for the first time and they haven't seen like the Hans Namuth uh, like photographs, you know, and like the, the kinetics and if they don't know the context of where that came out of and like, they don't understand like why they would be producing that art in that era, then it's just like, this looks like ridiculous. Like th this is a yeah. fucking con, um, you know? And it's like, but once you, once you learn about it a little bit, you're like, oh, okay. You know, I, you don't have to buy it fully, but you can buy, you can, at least you don't feel like an idiot. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I, I actually wanted to address a couple of other points, which I, I want to get a little bit technical, but I want to yeah. take this one point because it's happened to me personally. Um, I took a, a niece of mine to the Abu Dhabi Louvre, uh, and at right in the entrance of the Sai Twombly piece, uh, yeah. I don't know if people are aware, Sai Twombly is I like, Sai like Twombly. an amazing artist, so incredible. And it looks like she was like, 
what is this? This is like some guy just threw some paint on this thing and it's like dripping paint. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, let's take a moment, sit, just sit. Because they created this wonderful space there that you could just sit and like look at the paintings also, which I think another thing that is very uh, missing from American museum exhibition design versus like European exhibition design, where you're given opportunities for just meditation on the space in, in totally. European design. And American design just doesn't want you to sit because we have to put spikes in there so that the pigeons don't show up or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Some, some weird thing. But anyway, so she sat there and I was like, forget about the art. What did you feel? You know, and that conversation yeah. about what that thing is, is really the thing because we're taught that art is, you know, Michelangelo or like the Renaissance yeah. painters or something like this that is like something difficult to do instead of this is about a story that's there, you know? Yeah. And I think that, that gets to the, the, like the core of why some of these things have resonance and they don't because people look at modern art and they go, I don't get this. This is, you know, whatever, Basquiat, there's just some scribbles on a wall, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. Well, but, you know, it's, but I think part of it is, you know, it kind of goes back to this idea of, you know, of belonging to a space and like feeling like, you know, you know, like, like, uh, like, you know, the rule, like, you kind of like know the rules and like, and like you have enough context to feel like, okay, like I actually like, not, not like that, that I'm welcome here, that I belong here, yeah. you know? And I think, um, you know, there's a there's a lot of places where and I think museums are incredibly well intentioned in this space, but I, I think sometimes they like I, I think sometimes they you know they they get caught up in the wrong tactics. Um, but um, anyway, I don't want to monologue on my my opinions on this, but like I, I you know I I think the idea of the rules is like super super interesting, honestly, when it when it comes to these spaces, like what like how are people expected to behave? Yeah, I think. You know, th there's not really a good book of this, right? Like I was thinking about this, one of the issues that we have in experience design and perhaps even exhibit design is there, there are great books about this, you know, like uh, how to do sonography, how to do certain things. I would say there are fewer on how to do experience design as a, as a thing. You know, like yeah. one of my favorite books of all time from a technical perspective is actually two of them. One is called The Art of Electronics, which is like, you know, breaks down how to make like in-depth electronics. And the other yeah. one is, uh, you know, the gang of four books, like, you know, the design patterns. And these are yeah. sort of the, a, like a programming book. And the interesting thing is this idea of design patterns exists for this and every computer scientist out there knows what the design patterns of the gang of four book is you know it's just like this this is everything that that everyone has studied we do design patterns all the time but i can't oh. say like the, even between us we don't have a language to consistently kind of talk about something you know like the, and then this is one of my biggest pet peeves about our industry so people, a client will go, yeah, we want, uh, you want something that's interactive. And so somebody comes in and goes, okay. So in the modalities of interactive, there are a few different things. So even if we just take the simplest one, it's a touch interface, okay, touch screen. Even in the concept of a touch screen, is it a large touch screen? Can you touch the top of the touch screen? Can you touch the bottom? Is it, you know, is it just IR or is it capacitive? Is it multi-touch or pe multiple people? Like each of those has a name to it. You know, and in design patterns in the in the C++ programming world, you have these names, you know, you have a pattern, you have an MVC pattern, MVVC pattern, you have like, you know, a, a client server model, you have you, these kinds of things that we really need to start codifying, I think. Sorry, this yeah. is, you know, this is a book I'm writing on the side. So all of you who have some extra cash, send it my way while I'm, while I quit my job and write this book. I or we can it. write this book together. Kirsten, sorry, that's a call out to you as well. Who I see you're on the call. Um, but this is something that needs to be done because there are like so many things like this that create confusion in our world. Because it it's also because of a lack of common language, even between design firms, one design firm will come in and go, oh yeah, this is great interactive. And another one will say, oh, this is a shit interactive. We're going to create this other interactive. And even, even as I have conversations with people who are well-versed in this arena, 
we use the same word. We use experience. We use interactive. We use, you know, we use these, like these words that should be banned. <laughs> you know, yeah. we should never use these <laughs> words. Because no, they don't totally. mean anything. They're like at the end of the day, when Accenture and KPMG start pitching experiences and like, oh yeah, we're done. This is this this game is over, you know. So well, you know, it's but it's but I think it's so interesting too, because like a lot of times museums, like they're they're about um they I they they're they're about stewardship they're about longevity like they're they're like oh yeah yeah we're like we have to be the same all the way like like we we're we're passing the torch through generations so like this idea of like innovation or changing the medium or like thinking about the medium is like it doesn't always happen um and it's like so funny because i think about like how film has progressed from like the 1960s to today and then you look yeah. at like how museum design has progressed from 19, 1960s today and it's like not not they're they're really they're doing they're playing the same game you know it hasn't changed all that much i don't know if that's true like one of my irritations with the museum world is that the, this icom definition sorry i'm no i'm gonna upset a lot of people including my oh no no I mean, i'll be with you but this that. thing like defining a museum is not fair actually mm -hmm. the irony is that we can't be defined as a museum because we're not a non-profit you know and like you go well what does non-profit mean in a in a in a financial structure that doesn't need it who gives you know? a shit? So, well, <laughs> it, people give a shit because, like, the reason that nonprofits exist is because it's a tax evasion screen, scheme. So let's yeah. be honest about that part. Okay, you don't want to pay taxes, great. Like, if you want to give your money to something to not pay taxes, that's wonderful. In our system, we don't need that, you know? So we, why can't we join your club? And you go, oh, yeah, well, actually, this is... Then but this is where we go into the Groucho Marx world of if, if you allow me into your club, I probably don't want to be we want to be yeah. in it, you know. So yeah. we go down that path a little bit. But the the key in all of this is still like ensuring that the like why we're doing this is kind of held, you know, like held on some level that we can all be honest about it, I guess. And and some of that goes back into language, you know, like okay, the, one of the most important things I think. As, as museum makers or like experience makers is that we can create these places of comfort for people to tell their stories and the stories will be retained, which is a hard proposition when we talk about technology. Yeah. I mean, this goes to the point about sustaining or sustainability, you know, like in, a, in the broader context of how do you keep things alive, you know? And the keeping things alive, you know, I kind of speciously said, we should not be like one of the best ways for us to be sustainable is to not do anything, you know, yeah. turn it all off, you know, because the moment we turn it on, you have to consume electricity, which has to come from somewhere. You have to make a screen, which has to come from somewhere. But on the other hand, if you don't tell the stories, it doesn't work either. Like we sustain ourselves through the process of telling stories. This is what human condition is about. We have to be kind about how we create create those stories. We have to be very cognizant of whether it's damaging another part of the ecosystem. But if we can be honest, we can recognize the damage that we might be causing and still like, you know, think about it from a kind of bigger perspective and still get mm. somewhere and, and still, you know, deliver. It's it's not easy, but I think those conversations can happen. But but we have to still have a, a common language to start with, you know, in order to even get there. No, absolutely. And, you know, it's, and I, I mean, it's funny because I sometimes think about like the reason why like tortoises like live so long is because they have such a slow metabolic rate. They just like don't, nice, yeah. they don't do very much, you know? <laughs> so it's like, if you want something to live a very long time in the natural world, just like, don't do anything, you know, just like eat very slowly, you know, like, you know, you'll live a long time, but like, yeah. they're not particularly inspiring and dynamic creatures. Right. Um, like trees. But yeah, trees. Yeah, yeah, trees. Totally. Like we're also we're we're hyperactive. But then you know, on the other hand, ants are looking at us, going, "Oh my god, these guys are slow ass motherfuckers. What is wrong yeah. with human beings?" You know. And B is that exist for fourteen days. They're like, "Yeah, you know, we had a whole lifetime in this time, and these guys are still like just waking up." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so whatever, you know. But yeah. I think maybe there's a contextual thing there, but I, but this. I, I really like that point, but I think this also goes to the point about art, you know, and yeah. like experiences and all that. Sometimes you have to teach people to breathe to understand the thing that's in right front, right in front of them. 
you know so a cool thing that we have so th this gets into a little bit of the technicals i know i'm like we're probably like running out of time now oh i think we're like uh, probably way over it's okay but <laughs> i don't know where are we supposed okay. to go well, i don't know if we're no going problem. an hour or are we going 45 minutes we just keep going okay um okay one of the cool things that one of the hardest things for us to do in the u.s was have scent in in experiences okay oh okay. yeah smell is a hard one it's not it it has lots of cultural connotations plus as soon as you bring up scent in these conversations at least in the u.s that i was part of uh it was like oh no we, we will have allergy we will have this we will have that you know like th yeah. that's like the the naysaying starts pretty early on mm -hmm. in in the gulf area in in this region scent is so kind of part of the tradition and so Im imbued into everything that people do that it wasn't a question for us. It, it was like, of course we will have scent. We have scent in every single experience, a different scent for every experience. Oh, I love it. And there are people from the US who come in and they pick up on this so quickly and they're like, oh my God, like there's a different scent everywhere, right? Like, are they like, are they, they're like, I mean, a couple of people have been like, Am I crazy that like I'm smelling something different in a lot of places? And it makes me super happy because I'm like, yeah, no, this is true. This is exactly how how it's designed. And but not everyone is tuned to that. You know, like so people don't even stop and breathe and understand that there's a smell in the space. You mm -hmm. know? So each of those things is a layer in the storytelling that we kind of have to get people up to because and, and it's okay, you know, we don't, not everyone has to get everything like instantly. And I think, but there has to be enough layers that they can unpack and like kind of learn through the process, you know? Well, you know, it's, I, I think we were talking about this before, which is that like, you know, if you're trying to like teach a culture, like in some ways, like the food culture is such a better way to do it than, 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 than like the visual or material culture. Like, it, like if you're going to go to Morocco, like the chances of you going to the Moroccan museum to look at their like art and tapestries or whatever is probably very slim, but you're like, chances of like actually eating the food is very, very high because it's like multi-sensory. It's very personal. Like it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a, it's just a, it's just a much better vehicle for the culture in some ways than this other stuff. And, and I think you're right. Once you, you know, like, I, I think once you give yourself permission to operate with these other modalities, with, you know, sound, smell, light, um, you know, texture, like, you know, you can create much, much more rich experiences than these sort of like white cubes or, you know, temples. Yeah. One other, like a, a more maybe mundane point I want to make is that in all of these, having that vocabulary is is incredibly important early on. Totally. Like, I mean, I think as designers, and maybe, this is kind of harping to the crowd, at least to some people in the audience, I think, and probably to you, Josh, but in a project, defining your vocabulary and the kind of vernacular that you're gonna use early on is so incredibly important. Um, the thing that you know I made a mistake about, which I didn't realize for a very long time, so it, I did this during the presentation, so I was saying you know, this idea of using metaphors, like nobody understands your metaphors. Nobody understands my metaphors. I think all my uh, friends uh, here yeah. will like, you know- will <laughs> Only Philadelphians understand mine. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. We're on the same page. <laughs> but <laughs> but somehow we need shorthand to describe what it is we're doing because a, vo a vocabulary doesn't exist around us. Mm. The longhand is for the end visitor to understand. So essentially, like in movie parlance, like if you're making a movie, exactly. like one of my favorite like TV series right now by far is The Expanse. I don't know if you've watched, do you watch The Expanse? No, 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 I'm going to, I will though. That's a good, okay, I'll watch it's, it. It's, I mean, it's, I don't, I, I'm not saying that it's a great TV show, but mm -hmm. it is the best world building I have seen on any show. Oh, fantastic. It's okay, like man. they thought about so much detail. It is crazy. Um, but in many ways, this is what we have to do, right? Like, so at the Museum of the Future, like, so I'm going to go into the philosophical part of the sustaining, which is when somebody comes in and goes, okay, you are telling me you're the museum of the future. They come in with the expectation of what Hollywood has created, which is minority report. Okay. Mm -hmm. They are, they're expecting minority report. Suddenly we have basically 30 seconds to get them from essentially from minority report to lobster. If you've watched the movie lobster. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. I think yeah. lobster is like maybe one of the most amazing futuristic movies ever. 
right? What? It was the guy who said did the great. Is that the one? It's like, oh, maybe I maybe okay. Turn, someone turns into a lobster, right? They don't turn into one. I mean, it's like I have to rewatch it. Okay, yeah, yeah, keep going. Maybe I, yeah. Essentially, people can be put into different animal forms. Right? Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, so our, I mean, you don't know this. You're this is all in imagination, right? Okay. And there's there's all kind like it's it's such a crazy good movie. But to go from, you know, okay, or even Star Wars or Star Trek or something where there's a very defined, okay, in this future, you're going to have this flying objects and you're going to have these at-ats and you're going to have, you know, the, the tricorder and things like this. And this is what the future is, which is the future is about us as humanity telling a story to each other about something else, you know? So we've yeah. got a floor yeah. about health and wellness. How do you, then? and I was in the, the lift the other day that these two guys were like, yeah, you know, the fifth floor with space and all that, that was great. Like that totally made sense about the future. But this floor about health and wellness, I mean, who gives a shit about health and wellness in the future? This doesn't even make any sense. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> okay. okay. So, I mean, obviously people come in with their perceptions of these things. So how do you, you know, get that kind of sustainability going? Because what we want to leave people with is a residue. So the Museum of the City is New City of New York's objective sustainability wise is that people come in there and they remember that this is the story of a city. And mm -hmm. they understand that a city is not just you built some buildings and a city like magically happened. It required the cab driver, it required, you know, the Stanley Tucci, it required the, you know, our crumbs. It need it required like the this kind of pantheon of weirdos to make the place happen, you know? So each of the, like, and then that becomes like the narrative that people leave with and go, yeah, this, this is sustaining itself. Here, mm -hmm. when they leave, they have to go, yeah, something about this is the future. It doesn't have to be super obvious, but they have to wake up one night and go, aha, that, that thing was the future, you know? Yeah. I, I, I get it now. And so in, in a way, I think that's what we, are always trying to do in this process of both storytelling and creating a residual effect, you know? Mm. And, and to me, getting to that residual effect really is one of the kind of aspects of sustainability that we need to think about. And then of course, there's this other thing, which is if you're gonna have this residual effect, can you do it with a sense of kindness where people can actually implement something that is not destructive later on? Because we can easily tell the stories of war or, you know, like psychopathy and tell people, oh, you can, you should go out and like destroy something or like those people are bad or, you know, whatever, you know, it's, it's yeah. so easy. And, and it's just, we just have to be super careful about not crossing that line at all. Yeah, no. And I, and I think, I mean, I love this idea of like objectives and outcomes and, you know, like, like, and also just like a place having a purpose, like just being thoughtful about the purpose. Yeah. Um, you know, and, you know, and, and also the idea of like making museums or placemaking is like, as like sort of a medium that maybe like the rules are just not really like, we don't, don't talk about these things or amongst ourselves very much. Um, you know, cause, and, you know, and I think the other thing that's really interesting too, is this idea of like extending, you know, like, you know, like what, what happens next? You know, it's like, okay, so you've given someone a glimpse of the future, you know, you told them, you know, you, you've introduced them to the, all these like wonderful artists or to this, or to the story, to this thing, like, okay, well, how do you, how do you guide them? How do you guide them onto other things? Like how do you, and how do they, how do they enter a rabbit hole? How is it not just like this, like one yeah. little transaction that then, you know, it's like, oh, well, I, I glimpsed the future and then I, you know, and then I had no idea where to go from there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's really about building a community around it. I mean, yeah. in a way, like, so one of the most popular exhibitions in the U.S. in the last few years was the Andy Warhol, right? Like the traveling exhibition, like there, there were lines around outside the museum or like the Van Gogh, like again, lines yeah. are outside museums and stuff. The residual effect of that, what is the thing that people took away is kind of questionable for me. You know, everyone saw the Warhol is like, okay, whatever. But what was the kind of thing that they held on to afterwards? And uh, like, like, and how do you build a community around that? And in a way, like much of what the, the kind of charter that we have is to go, how do you build some community around these things? Because that's what keeps both the institution alive and also the, the message back to the general population, you know, what, what value they gain from it. So, yeah. uh, 
yeah, I don't know. Like, I think there's something in how we build that community, but and also building that community is very hard. So we at the museum, like one of my wishes is to figure out how we open source everything. Okay, mm -hmm. not because like open source itself is going to solve any problem, but other people need to know that they can make this stuff. You know, because there's a certain non-trivial amount of work that goes into this, and if they know that this is possible to do, they can also make the next tier up from there. To do that is hard because it's not about just giving it away. Like just because you wrote a book and gave it away doesn't mean other people are going to read it, you know? So yeah. that kind of framework of like having support systems and getting people to do stuff with it and teaching them to get to the next level. This is what we have to figure out how to do as well. And it, it, we, we're all reinventing this as we go. And there needs to be like a common framework, again, a language or something that we can sort of support each other to get to that next level. So I would almost yeah. throw this out as like a like a prompt for everyone, which is we do need as the museum and exhibition world, a set of common sort of idioms and also helpers that we go, okay, you use a CMS. Okay, here's like the top five CMSs. And I know that MCN and AM and all, like there are these conversations that have happened, but that repository doesn't exist where we keep keep it updated, you know? Yeah. Um, probably just start doing this because you know I know how to do like you know this, this is the stuff that I talk about and then I realize well I'm not doing it so why am I telling other people to do it you know? <laughs> yeah 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 well, it it sucks, but, you know like yeah we, we got to take some responsibility for it is my point no no I know 100 percent right and I think part of it is like you know again you know orienting towards you know orienting towards the visitor you know and orienting towards the people that we're trying to serve you know like and like we're trying to like actually um, I, 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 and, you know, try, I, I think this is all this, uh, that's just, I don't know. I'm going to go down this whole like scarcity abundance rabbit hole. Um, but I, I think, I think that like, I think museums, like I would like them to, I, I would like them to sort of embrace, I would like them to move faster than the turtle and to like, you know, and like want, and like want to see the potential in what they can be, you know, that they, that they actually have, I think museums have much, much greater potential to create a sense of place, to serve the place, to like anchor in the real, like the sort of um, de-exurbitization of America, um, you know, specifically, you know, <laughs> like, like, I, I feel like they, they have a bigger mandate and a bigger opportunity than they, than they realize. And I'd love to see them grasp it. And I would love to see the people who work in their orient towards something aspirational. Well, I, I will throw out a question, maybe, I, this, or, and my perception of what you're talking about. One of the reasons that I think a lot of institutions cannot move faster is just because of the inertia of existing systems. You know, if you take something as simple as ticketing, seemingly simple, and I know that there's a lot of like tessitura hate out there. Yeah. Uh, it, the, like when you think about solutions for these kinds of very mundane problems, you go, wow, this is hard. Even simpler than that, you go, oh, everyone's got SharePoint, you know, and it's like SharePoint has its value, but there's also a thing of like how complicated it is to do certain things. And you go, oh, should we just switch to Google Drive? Yeah. There's no just switching, you know, no. like there's so much work associated with this. And unless you are an expert having done this many, many times, there's a, an incredibly daunting path, like path ahead of you to, to make any of those transformations, right? So some of these things are well codified. You go, oh, we want to change out our exhibitions. Okay, we know like how this is done. We have to set up walls. We put up paintings. We put these into boxes. We, we know what the insurance is and all that. You go, okay, we want to change out our CRM. The number of times companies have, and institutions have decided on that path and spent millions of dollars just to scrap it at the end and realize this is not working <laughs> and go back to square one. And that is a super unfair thing. And it's just like, how is it possible that we're still dealing with some of this stuff, you know, in, in the 21st century? It's crazy. And yeah. so in a way, if we make that easier, everything else starts moving faster, I think. Oh, Maybe totally. I'll, I'll, like, and, you know, it's so funny because I... Like, yeah, then yeah. if you go to like any of these like museum directors' offices, I mean, I guess no one's going to the offices anymore, but like you'll see the same like binders of like, you know, like, oh, like we paid IDEO a half million dollars to do this report for us. And it's like <laughs> the same things yeah. that they could never, yeah. that they, you know, like, and there's so little sharing across organizations or institutions, you know, and such, you know, lack of like best practices. And then like some of the tooling sucks. I mean, TMS sucks. Yeah. 
But why can't we well, open it all up? There was a, actually, yeah. I had a conversation with somebody a couple of days ago. The Sharjah Art Foundation is one of the most amazing, exquisite art collections in the, in the world because it has one of the, the best curated art collections from the Arab world. Okay, which is something that doesn't get a lot of attention. There was a, a very good uh, exhibition of it at Gray Gallery in New York about three and a half years ago. The, but they couldn't just open source all of the content that they had because they had collaborated with some institutions in the UK, in the US, and they all have IP. Okay, yeah. And you go, IP is the bane of our existence. This is like, and I understand where the value proposition is to the artist. You want to pay the artist, pay the artist. But preventing a mechanism of like sharing is a whole other problem, you know, yeah. like that that we we have to figure out how to get past. And and in today's world, I, I really think, I mean, I hate this thing where a couple of years ago it used to be time before Trump in these conversations, like how yeah. how long does it take before you start talking about Trump? And today it's time before Chat GPT. So we mm -hmm. have gone almost an hour without talking about chat GPT. <laughs> so I'm counting it as- I got a whole other talk on that one. So now what are we doing? But when this, like I, the beautiful thing about it is that I think it is going to really bring up this conversation about what the, the core of IP is, you know? Like well, where is this thing coming from? Sorry, well, yeah. I, will, I, will, I will be doing some talks on chat GBT and Web3, and because I think Web3 also factors into this. So Sooner, I think a lot of people expected us to go a half hour, and we are almost at an hour. Um, so <laughs> they, uh, maybe we should wrap it up here. But um, uh, Nadia, I, I don't know if I should pass it back to you. Sooner, Mick, by the way, many, many thanks for doing this. Like, this Thank is you, super, super fun. Um, I, I'm just there, like- Any questions from the audience that we- No, they're just, know, they're just like- <laughs> They're just baffled. They just like, I don't know. They're just baffled. <laughs> like, what did I sign up for here? Okay. Well, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. You know, this is this is super fun. Um, you know, hopefully we'll do some of these again soon. Darth, many, many thanks again for doing this with us.